Um, thank you, all three of you, for, for these very articulate and very elegantly presented um, papers. Um, I was struck, as I'm sure many of you were, by the dialogue between Shannon's paper and Rachel's paper. Um, I'm sure you will have your own questions for each other. And actually, <laughs> maybe we should start with that. Would you, I would love for you to, if you have questions for each other, to, to go ahead, or I, could, or I can launch into my own. I think you should feel free to ask. <laughs> I need to marinate a little bit before. I, I yeah. have a question. Yes, please do. <laughs> Sorry. Please um, do. So with what Shannon was talking about, and then thinking about your paper, and you were talking about the materiality of gold and the importance of gold, mm -hmm. I couldn't help but think about those garnets in the middle mm -hmm. s that are right at the center. Mm -hmm. And are they always garnets, or are they glass? I don't know who to look at. Do I look at Shannon? Or, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I can only talk to my yeah, yeah, objects, yeah. but uh, they are garnets. garnets um, okay. and in the occasion of one of the crosses, the one from White Low, it was actually found with the setting empty. Mm -hmm. But I think because of other examples, um, they actually fitted a new one in there, I think in the 18th century, um, which was faceted, which is not typical of, of Anglo-Saxon garnet work. But. And, and just thinking about the prevalence of garnets mm -hmm. that is so common in Anglo-Saxon um, work from this period. I mean, I just didn't know if you had any thoughts about garnets. I mean, I've never thought about <laughs> what the garnet means. Um, I, I did get this question in York as well. Everyone's very interested in the garnets, as am I. And um, there's actually a paper that just came out in 2017 that I have not read yet that is all about, all about garnets, garnets and their okay. and their symbolism. Um, the only sources that I've read have, have just equated the red color to um, the blood of Christ, um, but then gold is also compared to the glory of kings, so there is certainly a Christological um, association. But um, Leslie Webster talks a lot about the contrast, so the contrast of the red and the gold. And um, I wish I knew how to embed a video into PowerPoint presentations <laughs> because I actually got to handle one of those crosses at the British Museum. And in the study room, the windows are so high and the light is perfect. And I was actually able to uh, take a video of the play of light off the surfaces as I, as I turned it, so. Yeah. And that was one of the um, points that struck me between your two papers was the importance of light, that it was not about, of course, colors <laughs> <laughs> comes from light, but, but the idea of, of light and not color as the focus of the, the theory. Um, I wonder if you could speak more to that. I think in two ways, because with the morning papers, we were talking about making the immaterial material. Um, so there's, that's one line of thinking. Another, another line of thinking that I saw in both of your papers was, um, Rachel, in your paper, you were talking about the, the use of light as a reaction to environmental conditions. And in Shannon, your paper, you were talking about the, the use of, you know, recreating light uh, as a way to control nature. So I wondered if you could talk to both of those points. Um, I mean, I can, I can start by saying that there's just a vast body of scholarship on the importance of light in Byzantium. It's one of the most recurrent themes of their sort of, what they valued in terms of aesthetics. So in ecfrasies or descriptions of churches or decorative programs, it's just light this and light that and reflection this and mirror that. And if you just look at the prevalence of mosaic as a, um, as a decoration strategy, you can really see it. Um, what I think is interesting in the case of this recipe is that they're not interested in light that reflects. They're interested in something that gives off its mm -hmm, own light. Mm -hmm. This is a different kind of power. This is something that lets you do things that you could otherwise not do um, with natural light. So this is a, a kind of... I don't want to say supernatural because it's something that happens in nature and they're, they're very clear about that, but it's a powerful thing. It's, an, it's an, a sort of special kind of light. Um, and that's what's really interesting. And like Rachel, it, I wish I could embed a video. <laughs> <laughs> the most the interesting thing to me is, is the antithesis. It was the antithesis of what I was expecting, which is Byzantine enamel looks like it would reflect a lot in bright light. It doesn't. When it's in bright light, the gold reflects off everything, and the enamel becomes almost like a silhouette. Um, the enamel glows when there's no light, or when there's very little light. 
because the gold becomes dimmed and the glass and the glass formulations are able to absorb and then reflect the light back out. Um, so that seems to be a play of light that they were very aware of and manipulating in a different way than they would do with mosaics, which capitalize on natural light. That's, I mean, that's an interesting um, dichotomy because of of course, the, the, a lot of these enamel objects are small, portable, yeah. handheld things versus you know the architectural interiors yeah. that, that you find mosaics in. So yeah. that's they did make very large architectural features out of enamel. They just okay. don't survive. Oh, good yeah. Um, I should open this up to questions for the audience. I have a question for Shannon. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, so, are theories of extra mission applied to that type of? Hmm. Material versus understanding other, you know, alternatives such as intromission yeah. for other materials. Um, I mean, I've never heard it discussed explicitly that way, or seen it come up that way in literature. There's very little discussion of like the affective nature of enamel. There's a lot of discussion of its implementation in um, spectacle and court ritual and in church. Um, in church processions and things like that. But they're very, actually in, in one case, the light isn't ever talked about about like uh, extra mission or intromission, but it is often described in, po in poetry as being visually disruptive. Mm -hmm. That it's sort of, um, it's described often in poetry as enameled armor on soldiers or um, fantastic fighters, and it blinds their opponents. <laughs> so it's often something that disrupts Vision. Hmm. Megan? I just want to share something with um, Shannon and Rachel and that my colleague Jean Campbell at Emory, we talk a lot about materials and about teaching with materials and she, I've never done this, but she with students shines with garnets direct artificial light, like a flashlight and apparently they do something wow inducing, very extraordinary. It's a kind of refract refracting of the light or luminescence. So they have, but it's, it's not something internal to them, but with an artificial, very direct, strong light, they will amaze. Good to know. <laughs> There's a question in the back. Thank you, I have a question for Ooh. Kayla. <laughs> My goodness. Um, let me speak into the fuzzy dice here. Um, Caitlin, I'm just wondering if you could um, extend the discussion into the architectural decoration, particularly of Polyuctos, where you have um, uh, gems or gem like mm -hmm. glass inlaid in the columns. Yeah. And the marble was painted, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just wondering, um, because you did this wonderful juxtaposition of real peacocks with the right. stone carved peacocks. Were the peacocks themselves painted? That's a great question. Um, and there is a lot of debate about whether or not those peacocks in St. Polyuctos were painted. We know that the inscription that surrounds the peacocks that they it definitely had a blue background and the letters themselves were probably gilded, which is very similar to the types of um, church inscriptions that you see in places like Rome that are still extant in mosaic, for example. The peacocks themselves <coughs> though, it's hard to know if they were painted um, because we don't have any pigment that survives on them. It would make sense to me that they would be painted, um, but I don't think it's necessarily that important given what you were alluding to, the installation inside the church, aside from these ridiculous peacocks, there were also, <laughs> I mean, they're over the top, um, but there were also um, in the chiborium or the templon screen, the columns themselves were made out of the same type of Prokinesian marble that was inlaid with glass that's yeah. meant to mimic gemstones yeah. and also amethyst gemstones. So you have real gemstones and mimicked gemstones being embedded into um, the architectural fabric. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think the choice of color is also quite important to consider with those columns, which I should have brought a picture of. Um, but these columns, so they have gold glass um, that would have surrounded each of these um, sort of cabochons of 
green glass and also of amethyst. And so these are the colors of peacock feathers. So it's another layer of this peacock imagery kind of pervading the interior of that really over the top space, sacred, sacred space, which is important to remember. To, to extend on that question, you, do, do you, does decoration survive from, or it, the, the structure doesn't survive, but does, does any evidence of the decoration of Santo Stefano survive? And That's a great question, and no. No, too I know, bad. I know. I know. It's a total bummer. Yeah. So Santo <laughs> Stefano is tough because we have the floor plan, um, but we don't have anything else, and we have the footings of the columns, um, so we can get the sense of the space. And it's a really conservative um, type of architectural style. You know, it's a basilica style. It has one nave with little side aisles, um, maybe a little bit of uh, transept. One thing that is interesting about Santo Stefano is that there was a baptistry attached to the back of it that was created out of one of the rooms in the villa. Um, hmm. So thinking about the creation of new Christians in the fifth century out in, you know, kind of on the edge of the city is a little weird. Um, and also, Underneath the chancel, so underneath the altar, there was some kind of a crypt down there. Unfortunately, there were no relics of Stephen there, um, but a lot of people have wondered whether or not, you know, could this have been intended for um, some kind of a space where relics could have been kept. But that's, that's as far as we can go. We do have, and I showed the example, we do have some of the, um, the marble sculptures from the villa, which was still on display at some point while the church was still in use. So you have some of these classical sculptures that are still decorating the rooms that are um, you know, kind of supporting the sides of the church, which is really interesting. So thinking about that play of this Christian sacred space rising out of this thoroughly pagan, this old Roman villa. But that's as far as I can go. I would love to go farther. <laughs> Oh. Uh, uh, X-rays of the enamels um, that you were showing, and I was really struck by this use of the, the, the gold wire for cloisonné, but that's not actually making cloison, that, but rather it's giving a sort of um, modeling effect of um, further shaping how light is reflecting and refracting. And to me, this seems really interesting as part of a representational project because modeling, right, is, it, 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 as you think about it in painting, is trying to um, achieve three dimensions by showing light and shadows as it's uh, uh, working across a, 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 a three-dimensional shape. And actually, you're getting the same effect or kind of um, striving for the same effect, but using completely different means of using gold wire and light and glass. And I just wanted to um, um, see if you've been thinking about it in that ways or in that way, or um, if you had a, other thoughts about kind of um, the representational qualities um, 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 paired with the, the, the technical work that you're doing, which is fabulous. So it looks, when I show it like this, like the, the cloison wire, which is not visible, it also, it would seem to make sense that it would be sort of um, pushing the level of the glass up to create these modeling effects that you're talking about, but it doesn't. But, but you see it with the, the difference in light. You, you don't, actually. Don't Only when it's un, under transparent glass. When it's under the opaque glass, you can't see it whatsoever. Um, so enamel is always um, polished all the way down so that it's level with the metal. So if, so it would actually, you would be able to see those wires. Um, they would be sort of, it would, it wouldn't, you would, they would have to be raised to such a degree that the glass wouldn't be able to cover them to create these modeling effects. It's hard to, I'm having a hard time describing it. Are the cloisons that are hidden, are they shorter? They're shorter. So, okay. yes. so they're shorter. So they don't actually affect the refraction of light on the surface of the glass. So when it's transparent, when it's transparent it does. Because then the light will hit, will pass through the glass and bounce off the submerged wires. Um, so I've asked myself this question. Why are the um, wires that can't be seen under the opaque glass, why are they 
why are they sort of figural? Why are they modeling hair or um, expressions of the, um, the forehead and the hands? And part of it is practical, part of it is it helps the glass adhere and prevents it from cracking and breaking and falling out. Um, but I have to wonder to myself, um, in, the, in that particular collection of enamels, some of the halos are opaque and some of them are translucent, but the wires are present in all of them, um, which leads me to believe that in, in the one sense, this is a, um, the decision for what color the glass would be was made after the design. Um, and it was kind of, I think they must have decided based on what the object was that these were on originally. Um, and we don't know what the original object was that they were attached to. Um, it w would have probably played off of the aesthetic sensibilities of that object. Um, the other thing I wonder is if part of this is just part of the artistic working pro uh, progress, uh, process. So if you're an enameler, you're making enamels of different kinds, not just these roundels or whatever, you're used to fashioning wires that are outlining figures and features and that sort of thing. And why would you not continue to do that anyway? You know, it, it also helps refine the artist's sensibility for those figures um, and those shapes of wire. Um, but it's something I'm still working through because it's, that's, I, I got to the same conclusion you did, that it was creating different effects of light on the surface of the glass, but it only does that behind translucent fill, not under the opaque ones, and they were still doing it. And it's not just on this object, it's on objects in Venice, it's in objects in, um, in uh, Georgia, and things like that. So thank you. Um, I, I was struck by all th the fact that all three papers somehow had something to do with or were interested in the, the manner in which materials were set in some kind of relation to nature or the natural world. And I know, I mean, I'm a scholar of the 18th and 19th century, so I know my nature is not <laughs> your nature. Um, but, and what I'm about to say might grossly simplify what each of you was arguing, but it, it, it struck me that each of you was describing a different kind of relation between materials and nature. Um, so in the case of the peacocks, it was a, re a relation of imitation, right? So, so figural imitation, but also the use of materials to imitate colors and the effects of those colors in combination. And in the case of the, the, the enamel, the relation was something like a, not a substitution, because of course you so rightly said these are natural properties, but it's something like enamel as its own natural world, right? And then, and then in the case of the crosses, y you described an interactivity between the, the wearable cross and meteorology and climate and uh, gray skies and so on and so forth, but also light uh, as, a, as an atmospheric phenomenon. And so I'm wondering if these the configurations of these relationships that you described, I mean, is, do they come from or do, uh, from contemporaneous discourses about the natural world or about the relationships imagined between different living entities or humans and the non-human? I mean, is, is, are there these larger discourses on which these practices drew? Because I was so struck by the fact that each paper was about I'm simplifying, but some kind of relation of this sort. <laughs> um, I'm dealing with a primarily preliterate people uh, until the uh, introduction of Christianity. So um, a lot of the poetry that's been written down, one would assume, is coming through an oral tradition into you know in, into writing. Um, but the natural world. Uh, is only described in poems like the Seafarer or um, St. Guthlac's writings uh, because he decided to be a hermit in a very unpleasant place. Uh, so um, it's really only in, in poetry that we find that in the Anglo-Saxon world um, and not really anywhere else. Um, as C.R. Dodwell points out, that's the only 
mention of the actual physical environment. When it comes to interaction with the animal world, there's certainly more description of that. Um, but I, I just thought, I was just struck by the fact that the old English language had specific words, not just for red, blue, green, but varying brightnesses. And I thought that that was the strongest argument to argue for a sensitivity to light in that particular environment, which they had been in for some time. And if we you know, um, believe Bede, or if we believe you know, the various um, uh, genealogical or uh, genetic you know, um, migration patterns that are being put forth right now, if, if we generally assume that these are northern people from Scandinavia or from German areas, you, you would assume that the environment would be similar although it's a very disparate amount of people coming in, and that's, that's the whole problem with the word Anglo-Saxon, and that's a whole other uh, argument. But um, yeah, I, I definitely think that there's uh, a relation to nature, especially the, the forces of, of nature sort of being synonymous with the forces that are supernatural. I don't think that there was really a bifurcation of those in popular thought, and then that sort of um, conditioned not only crosses, uh, which were conditioned not only by, I think, this sensitivity to the environment, but also by uh, culturally, by continental fashions, you know, a relationship with Frankish kingdoms where it was the fashion to use golden garnets. Um, but I, I definitely think of, of all the fashions they could have chosen, um, there must be some other reasons behind it, you know, that, that are more deeply biological. I think there's a lot at play. You can't reduce one to culture, you can't reduce one to biology, so. Look at those those period descriptions or, or or configurations of human animal relations to get a sense of what relationality as such mm -hmm. was conceived uh, how it was conceived of in the period so that you might develop a kind of armature or framework for thinking okay well if this is period understanding of relationality mm -hmm. how might that help me describe this network of relations that's been established among mm -hmm. atmospheric phenomena, materials, and, sure. and bodies. That, that seems yeah. like a place you might want to go. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. I mean, the amuletic tradition, uh, one of my slides, had a beaver's tooth, which was yes, uh, very, yes, yeah. very <laughs> prominent in female graves, as are these crosses are most prominent in female graves. So that's an interesting relation. Yeah. And, um, in other parts of my research, I've actually talked about um, helmets from this period, um, which typically, we have about three examples um, that we mainly refer to, but one from Bente Grange has a nasal with a cross protecting the forehead, mm. where you can also be blessed with the sign of the cross, and yet at the top is a, um, a boar, a heraldic or protective boar with garnet eyes set into the boar. Nice. So, and that was found um, close to some other artifacts of the cross. So, and then even the, the copper gate helmet has over the, the cross bars, there's an inscription of protection, uh, invoking God for protection, and yet there's a, a dragon that comes down the nasal. So um, there's certainly a, a, a synchronicity between, uh, there's never the end of paganism and the beginning of right. Christianity, so there's, there's these ideas are coalescing, and I think the protective element is, is, extends not only to protection from, or competition with animals, because I think there was that relationship for the Anglo-Saxons, there was both of those elements happening, and then this protective quality of the cross, so merged into certain elements, like the, or certain objects, like the Venti Green helmet. Um, just to jump off of from the animal discussion, yeah, you're jumping the peacock <laughs> um, person. Um, so the the peacocks are interesting. Um, we have lots of descriptions of peacock, lots of ancient descriptions of peacocks. Um, their behavior was known. They were bred. I mean, in my dissertation, I go well into this. I'm, just <laughs> I'm going well into it, so I get excited. Um, but so there's lots of discussions about this, and they they are also used in poetry. Um, and I think most interestingly for these patrons, which unlike Rachel's, they are highly literate. Um, the Anikii were Anikii Juliana, especially she would have been raised in a very classically educated household. Um, and 
in those educational settings, they were um, in late antiquity, they would be doing these um, ekphrastic exercises mm -hmm. where they would recite and they would um, write down and copy from memory these descriptions of all sorts of things from buildings to plants. And there's one really lovely example that in a lo longer version of this paper that I gave a few years ago um, is an ekphrasis on a peacock and what a peacock does. Hmm. And it's not just a peacock walking around with its tail down, because that's not exciting. It's a peacock with its tail spread. Um, and I think what's interesting is that so often when you see images of peacocks in early Christian churches, and they are literally everywhere. I mean, I get pictures of them all the time. Look at this peacock I found. Of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but these... <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, but these peacocks, what, what is so significant about them is that they aren't the kind of docile images of them with their tails down. They are actually in this aggressive pose. I mean, when peacocks, if anybody's been to a zoo or been to, like, I guess, some rich person's house, and they have peacocks <laughs> walking around, they're very aggressive, and they're loud, and they're obnoxious. And when they have their tails up, they're in a, a gesture of mating. So it has to do with this aggression, I think, that in some cases is pushing against the boundary of what is and is not appropriate um, for inclusion inside a mm -hmm, church. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that you know you can have mosaics of peacocks with their tails up. So at San Vitale, in the presbytery of the, the kind of groin vault over the presbytery, there are peacocks with their tails up. But they're not, it's not as conspicuous as it is. Um, in St. Paul Yuktos, where it literally is a gauntlet. You walk in, and you would have just been bombarded mm -hmm. with these images. And it's very possible, given what we know about garden culture in late mm -hmm. into Constantinople, that Enikia Juliana, on the grounds of her palace, could have had peacocks mm -hmm. walking around. I mean, that was also a status symbol. So it's very, very possible that people going to the complex could have passed by one of those loud, obnoxious peacocks and then walk in and they see all these quiet ones, thankfully. <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting. So they are very much part of um, the classical and then into late antiquity, they're still, they're still continued. And in medieval Byzantium too, yeah, I mean, they love them. I'll keep it a brief answer to this, which is that, again, I'm dealing with a highly literate section of the Byzantine populace. These are scholars who are writing these alchemical texts. I and mean, we don't know exactly who they are, who, how they're learning, but they're very literate people and they're drawing on a long literary tradition. What I find most interesting about the alchemical texts in Byzantium, which are very understudied, there's a small group of people working on them, but they're, um, they're not a full part of like the Byzantine studies canon as of yet. Um, they are all about nature. They are trying to understand nature through artistic um, techniques, which is um, where I've drawn upon Pamela H. Smith, um, because I do believe that these scholars are actually using interaction with artisans to learn about things like geology and metals and um, even bread baking or explosive making or whatever. <laughs> um, but the, what I find most fascinating about this genre is that the undercurrent of all of this is not just to learn about nature, but to control it, to direct it towards the ends that you want it to behave under. In some cases, that means artificially reproducing it. It means accelerating natural processes, um, or even um, making a natural process have a kind of surprising end that it wouldn't, natu it wouldn't have on its own. So the discourse is very much of controlling nature and discovering it for the purposes of control. I think I have the whatever you call this. <laughs> um, and um, thank you all, it was terrific papers and I love to hear the emphasis on the materiality. Um, and light, um, we use so many inappropriate jargon terms that are modern. Um, illumination is actually a medieval term. Um, and it's not about color, it's about brightness. Um, and with a lot of scriptural connotations as well. Um, I just wanted to say a word about peacocks. Okay. Um, I'm also sometimes accused of being obsessed with peacocks, but I, I think in this particular case, I mean, they are everywhere, but nowhere else with this intensity yeah. as the, the super point. subject. And, and I, I just wonder whether since your project is about the assertion of aristocratic privilege mm -hmm. 
and in a family that does have such strong classicizing roots, whether the fact that the, the peacock is Juno's bird yeah, um, oh, is, is yeah. really, she's making a claim yes. about um, her, her uh, own, uh -huh. she should be queen. Oh, absolutely. Um, and that, and certainly any Q Juliana, for those of you who are not, you know, as, you know, into this as I am. Um, <laughs> and Eke Juliana, she, when the, pre, the emperor, the two emperors before Justinian, um, she thought that her son should be emperor. And he was passed over for um, Justinian's uncle. Um, and then Justinian took power. So um, there's this, you know, sort of, we don't, it's an apocryphal story. We don't know how an anecdotal story about um, Justinian visiting St. Polyuctos and um, come, going there to collect money from her, right? So, every, yeah, you know the story. Um, so he goes to collect money from her, and she says, oh, I don't have any money right now. I have to collect it for you, so come back in two weeks, and I'll give you your money. He comes back in two weeks. She takes him. She's this old lady, okay? And they walk into the church, and she says, look up your money. You know, the gold is on the beams of this church. Do what you want with it. And of course, he's not going to desecrate a church. He's not going to remove those those golden beams. Um, so yeah, so there is definitely this um, power play, these power plays that are happening. And the peacock, I, I argue in my um, larger project, is really a perfect animal and symbol for this type of aggressive um, self-promotion, for sure, because that's what a peacock does, you know. And and Yuki Juliana knew that. Yeah. So. Are we doing on time? Time to go. Oh, so I think we have to wrap up this session. <laughs> this has been really exciting. Um, <laughs> gems and peacocks. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>